Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this lecture, I'll teach you how to identify and distinguish the major groups of early Mississippian and Pennsylvanian tetrapods. These groups of early tetrapods would split into lineages that would go on to evolve into modern amphibians, the list amphibia, as well as reptiles, birds, and mammals, the amiota. During the early Mississippian period, a handful of early tetrapods were exploiting the shallow rivers and ponds, using their four limbs mostly for, for swimming, with limited abilities for walking short distances. Now, these limbs likely function mostly in emergency situations, when the shallow ponds or rivers would dry up during the summer seasons. Now, these limbs would allow these early tetrapods to escape the drying up of pools of water and be able to find a new home and survive to reproduce. As such, most of the early Mississippian tetrapods were spending most of their life cycle in the water. One of the best known early Mississippian tetrapods is Crasia gyrius from Scotland. Now, Crasia gyrius was about the size of a medium crocodile, about 1.5 meters long, with a skull that measured about 38 centimeters long. The head was large, and these creatures were likely feeding on fish. Now, the weird thing about Crasia gyrius was that it had a very reduced forelimb with a small little dainty hand. The posterior limbs were better developed, but much of the locomotion of this creature was powered by a large compressed tail. Such anatomy likely meant that the animal spent a great deal of time in the water. Another early vertebrate from the early Mississippian is Geriaprion from West Virginia. It too was a fairly large tetrapod with lengths up to a meter or more long. Bony scutes covered the body, which made this creature armored, which is not found in modern amphibians. The body was extremely elongated with numerous vertebrae between the forelimb and the hind limb, such that it resembled a long snake. The tail was also compressed, which meant that it was used for swimming by moving it backward and forward. The skull was flattened and lacked an otic notch, with the bones grooved with lateral line canals that served to detect movement and vibrations in the surrounding water. Geriopteron was likely feeding on fish, primarily. One of the innovations we see in these early tetrapods is improvement in jaw muscles, which is found in the Mississippian tetrapod Megaliocephalus, which provided a stronger bite, as well as muscles to open the jaw. Now, many of these early tetrapods are placed in a large group of early tetrapods called tendospundulins, which is a large paraphyletic group of early tetrapods, which include over 170 genera and 40 families. The Temnospondyla were success, a successful group of basal tetrapods that survived into the Mesozoic as recently as the early Cretaceous. Now, the next few fossils I'll talk about belong to a monophyletic branch called the U Temnospondyla, which includes a very diverse group of late Paleozoic early tetrapods, as well as the lineage that leads to modern list amphibians like frogs and salamanders. As such, this group is considered more closely related to frogs than to lizards. One of the best known Eutemnospondylins is from the fantastic Joggings fossil site in Nova Scotia. It's a Pennsylvanian site in Canada. This is Dendroptron. Now, what's so amazing about Dendroptron is that it is much more of a terrestrial animal than we have seen so far in this class. These fossils are found in hollow, petrified lycaeopsid trees that are found along the modern-day coastline. Now, Dendroptron 
could climb out of the river and the ponds and into and on trees. So they were the first tetrapod that could really start climbing around. We can see that they have much more upright bodies with a more rounded head. Now the otic notch contains a stapes, so they could hear in the air and likely were feeding on insects rather than fish. As such, they had large eyes and they have a large interpterygoid vacuity, which is an opening in the roof of the mouth, a trait found in other advanced eutendospondylins. The vulmar bone is also large in the roof of the mouth as well. During the Permian and even into the Triassic, the eutemnospondylins were very successful. The Permian saw the origin of some very large groups, including the giant Uriops, known from Texas, which grew to be about two meters long. These groups were most closely related to modern amphibians. As such, some of these forms show a unique lifestyle of delaying the development of adult features and retaining juvenile traits as adults. This variability in the development of traits during the lifespan is referred to as heterochrony, which means different timing. The retention of juvenile traits like gills into adulthood is referred to as pedomorphism while paramorphism refers to the expansion of characters late in life, such as the ostification of the pelvis and carpals and tarsals, the finger and toe bones, to facilitate terrestrial locomotion. We see this heterochrony play out with the eutemnospondylus in Pennsylvanian and Permian fossils of sclerocephalus and orthocantylus in Germany. Now here, a large series of fossil individuals have been found from different ancient lake systems, showing how in some lakes, juvenile forms are the only ones found, while in other lakes, the same genera shows more advanced adult features, which allowed them to move out of the aquatic habitat if the lake was prone to drying out or the presence of aquatic predators that they needed to escape from. We see such patterns in modern salamanders and frogs where juvenile forms can become sexually mature and never take to the land and spend the entire lifespan in the water. Within these eutemnospondylins, we begin to see the development of metamorphism that characterizes modern amphibians. These eutemnospondylins would continue to be diverse during the Permian, with several groups surviving into the Mesozoic, including the Trimatosauria and the Capitosauria. They hung on during the Jurassic with the last species known from the early Cretaceous. However, during the Triassic, within this group, modern amphibians, including frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians originated. And we'll talk about their evolution in a later lecture. All right, let's now focus on the other major lineage of early tetrapods, the ones that would eventually lead to reptiles, birds, and mammals. These are called the leptospondylins. Now the leptospondylins are a diverse group that lived during the Pennsylvanian period and into the Permian. The early leptospondylins are called the anthracosaurs, or embolomeria, which were elongated, crocodilian-like tetrapods that grew to modest sizes and fed on fish, although others likely fed on insects and were more terrestrial in their habit. These anthracosaurs lacked the open roof of the mouth of the eutemnospondylins and had large eyes and a well-developed otic notch in the back of the skull for hearing. The next group of Pennsylvanian leptospondylins are the elongated serpent-like microsaurs, including the small fossil Microbrachius and Teutaneus. Now, microsaurs had numerous vertebrae between their limbs 
making them long and tube-like. Now, microsaurs might not form a monophyletic group, and their relationship within leptospondylins has moved around lately. Several of the early leptospondylins lost their limbs entirely, including members of the next group, the aestiopods, which resembled snakes. They have remarkably slender skulls, which are very nimble and have the brain case exposed. These early snake-like animals likely took to the land and fed on the abundance of insects. And several got rather large in size, with lengths up to a meter long, with 230 vertebrae. The next leptospondylins are the Necrodae, the boomerang-shaped early tetrapod known from the Pennsylvanian and Permian of Ohio and West Virginia, as well as other sites in Africa. The Necrodae feature horned skulls that grew throughout the life of the individual, which formed long projections on either side of the head. Now, these leptospondylins likely used these horns to generate lift as they swam, like wings of an airplane. These were likely fully aquatic early tetrapods feeding on fish and small aquatic invertebrates. Now, the next two groups I'll mention are restricted to the Permian period and represent the biggest shift toward a more fully terrestrial lifestyle. These two groups have shuffled around in their relationship to each other, but both are unique in having more upright limbs and better developed hands and feet. The first group is the Seamoromorpha, a diverse group that is well known from some amazing fossil sites in Germany, as well as in the United States. Several groups persisted in Russia into the Triassic. The genus Seamoria featured an upright body and thicker limb bones to support a more fully walking style of locomotion. The body was short and squat and likely walked with an undulating pattern of limb movements, but had a shorter trunk than we've seen before. The last group of leptospondylins are the most advanced of these early tetrapods known from the Permian. They are unique in being the first tetrapod to switch to a vegetarian diet. These are the Didecomorpha, a group very closely related to the origin of amiotes and later reptiles. They have short, peg-like teeth that were likely used to nip at plants. These are the first herbivorous vertebrates that were able to exploit the lush forests of the early Permian period. They did not have to worry much about predators, and so their bodies were broad and low to the ground, with a sauntering locomotive style. The feet featured well-developed digits, five in number, which supported the animal to move around the forest floor, feasting on a new source of food. All right, you should be able to identify and distinguish the major groups of these late Paleozoic tetrapods, the Eutemnospondyla, the Microsauria, the Necrodea, the Astopoda, the Anthracosauria, the Seamoromorpha, and the Didecomorpha. In the next lecture, we will look at how these groups have been defined based on their unique development of the vertebral column. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin Links are found in the description below.